scripture comes to us this morning from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, verses 28 through 35. Hear the word of the Lord. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he was going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening and the day is nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. And when he was at the table with them, he took the bread and blessed and broke it, and he gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour they got up and they returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, the Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. And they told what had happened on the road and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. As you know, especially those of you who are, is a condition of the eye that weakens your ability to see things far away. But things that are near come into focus clearly. Now in the afternoon of the resurrection of Jesus, two of his followers decided to go home leave Jerusalem. And they lived in a village called Emmaus, about seven miles walk from Jerusalem. Luke only names Cleopas, but they were most likely Cleopas and his wife Mary. In the Gospel of John, uh, he has, uh, John has Mary, the wife of Clopas, he calls him, standing at the cross with Mary, the mother of Jesus, and Mary Magdalene, while Jesus hung on the cross and apparently until his death. And as they returned home, they were talking about everything that had happened over the last few days, probably talking about the triumphal entry, the irony of the triumphal entry, and then, and then his subsequent arrest and crucifixion. They talked about crushed dreams and how hopeless their future was now. They had hoped. Oh, oh, they had hoped. Jesus was the one to save Israel, to rescue and deliver them from the present hardships and persecutions in their lives, the life under Roman rule that could be taken away for no just cause. Their righteous cause was defeated. All of their work and sacrifice for naught Evil had seemingly won out over good. But oh, they had hoped. And as they walked, they probably recounted the stories of Jesus, Jesus healing the sick, of taking the content of a boy's lunchbox and feeding 5,000, calming the sea, oh, and raising their friend Lazarus from, from, from the dead. And Jesus could tell stories like no one else in their lifetime the story of the prodigal son, the loving father, the shepherd leaving 99 sheep to go out and find one lost sheep. Oh, how we loved Jesus' stories. But now, but now we have no hope. What will we do now? How long, Cleopas, how long must we suffer under the cruel reign of the Romans? When will, when will our deliverance come? I don't know, Mary. I don't know, Mary. God help us. They walked. They walked away from Jerusalem. They walked away from the disciples. They walked perhaps trying to put some distance between them and the pain that they had experienced in Jerusalem. And while they walked, their road of despair grieved over the death of their master and friend, grieved over the death of their hope. Jesus came, came and walked with them. But they didn't recognize him. Even though they had heard, uh, heard reports of Mary seeing Jesus alive early the same morning. Peter also by this time. And the last person they thought they would see on this dusty road with the sun going down on all of their hope was Jesus. Who three days earlier was put to death by the Romans. 
And this stranger, so they thought, came alongside and asked them what they were discussing with each other on the way. There was probably a flood of emotion in their, in their discussion, an impassioned discussion. The question, the question that Jesus asked them, what are you discussing, uh, stopped them in their tracks. They couldn't believe what they were hearing. Have you been living under a rock? Uh, don't you watch the news? Are you not aware of the recent and tragic events that have taken place here in Jerusalem over the last few days? What events? What things? They replied, the things about Jesus of Nazareth, uh, who was a prophet, mighty indeed, uh, a word and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests, our religious leaders, handed him over to be condemned to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped, we had hoped that he would be the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it's now the third day since these things took place. He raised Lazarus after four days, but it's been three days. And Jesus upbraided them a little bit, gave uh, Cleopas and Mary uh, a mild scolding. How foolish you are and slow to believe what the prophets have written. Wasn't it necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things? Cleopas and Mary plodding back to Emmaus after her, the horrific events that ended in Jesus' death were unable to recognize their risen Lord uh, when he comes alongside and walks with them on their journey uh, uh, of defeat and hopelessness. Their focus on the dire circumstances present in their life, their myopic sight, their, their nearsightedness, the inability to see beyond the immediate circumstances of their lives, they could see, they could see their despair, they could see their heartache, they could see their fear, they could see their anxieties, the focus on the present distresses of their lives pre prevented them from seeing the presence of God. In Sue Monk Kidd's uh, book, The Life, The Secret Life of Bees, August, a wise black woman and beekeeper, was telling Lily, a 14-year-old girl uh, who found refuge in August's home after running away from bad memories and an abusive father, was telling Lily a tall tale that Big Mama, her grandmother, had told her when she was growing up. Big Mama, she says, told me that on Christmas Eve she went out and out to the beehives and she could hear the bees singing the words of the Christmas story right out of the Gospel of Luke. Big Mama began to sing, Mary, Mary brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger. But Lily giggled and said, uh, really, do you th think this really happened, August? And August replied, y yes and no. Some things happen in a literal way. And some things, like the bees singing their version of their Christmas carols, in a not literal way. But they still happen, August said. What I mean by that is the bees weren't really singing the words from the Gospel of Luke. But if you have the right kind of ears, you can listen to a beehive and hear the Christmas story somewhere inside yourself. And if you have the right kind of ears, Lily, you can hear silent things on the other side of the everyday world that nobody else can. Big Mama, she had those kinds of ears. And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, Jesus interpreted to them the things about himself in all of the scriptures. And as they approached their home, they, they compelled this stranger to come in and not walk any further in the dark. So he did. And when they sat down for dinner and they saw Jesus take the bread, give thanks for the bread and break it and offer it to them, their eyes were opened their nearsightedness went away. He vanished from their sight. But they said to each other, were not our hearts burning within us while, while he was talking, uh, talking to us on the road? And while he was opening the scriptures to us? And that very same hour, probably without finishing dinner, they jumped up and ran back to Jerusalem where the other disciples were and bust into the house where they were still hiding on the night of the resurrection. And they were by that time saying, the Lord has risen indeed 
and Cleopas and Mary shared their story about Jesus walking with them and how he made himself known to them in the breaking of the bread. As I said earlier in the welcome and in the email that I sent out to you, uh, virtual communion is not ideal. And we struggled with it. We had discussions about this and our bishops and, and bishops and, and the church around the world are still talking about and discussing and arguing about uh, uh, this act of worship by way of online, this virtual Eucharist, this virtual communion. But as I said in my email, this sacrament is too important for us to just ignore why we're not together. And although we're not together, the efficacy, the strength, the power in the Holy Communion is Christ with us by and through his Holy Spirit. And Christ is not confined. His Holy Spirit is not confined uh, to the boundaries of this church, to inside these walls. The Holy Spirit can, can go outside of these walls. And when I say the words, come Holy Spirit, bless these, bless these gathered here. Invite the Holy Spirit into your home and into your life. And if, if we have the right kind of ears to hear, and if we have the right kind of eyes to see, we too will be able to see things on the other side, at a distance, on the other side of the immediate concerns of our lives. And if you have ears to hear and eyes to see, Jesus will make his presence known to you in this act of worship. In the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.